Dr. Ludger Fischer graduated in mechanical and process engineering at RWTH Aachen. After his PhD at uh, Kashu Institute of Technology, he joined the company Kuni AG in Switzerland as head of R&D and later head of sales. He signed responsible for the company Akato Unimix as managing director and had several leading positions within the AC Serendip Group in Switzerland, Germany, and China. During his industrial career, Dr. Fisher invented several uh, new technologies and processes within the field of thermal separation, uh, mixing and dispersing medical devices, and nanotechnology. In combination with his inventions, several patents were granted. After his uh, successful exit and uh, since 2013, he is lecturer at uh, the HS Lucen University, part of the Institute of Mechanical Engineering and Energy, IME, and co-head of the uh, Competence Center of Thermal Energy Storage. Uh, priorities at the Lucen uh, University of Applied Science and Arts a project management of uh, uh, applied R&D within the field of energy storage and process engineering, as well as basic research for new materials within the field of energy storage and conversion. Furthermore, Dr. Fisher handles projects with the application of phase change materials within thermal storage systems. His particular interest lies uh, within the field of phase change dispersions, compounds, building application, and uh, seasonal thermal storages. His guest lecturer at University of Arts in uh, London, uh, UAR and ZHAW. Uh, and uh, since 2019, Dr. Ludger Fisher is affiliated with uh, a researcher at the at MIT, uh, Cambridge. Dr. Ludger uh, Fisher, today's talk title is uh, Sensible and Seasonal Thermal Energy. Uh, yeah, so let's welcome. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Shin, for that nice introduction. I hope everybody can hear me, that my speaker is working correctly. And uh, I, will, I will start with my presentation then. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the invitation to have the possibility, and I think my presentation will be a, a bit different because I will show a couple of examples of realized thermal energy storage uh, solutions, which we do in Switzerland. Uh, what you see here is uh, not only the outline of my presentation, you see the picture of the Lucerne University. We are located at the Lake of Lucerne in Switzerland and Switzerland is in many terms a particular country. First of all, we are a very small country compared to US, China, India and all the other countries. Uh, our energy system is, um, is different. We have 60% of our electricity production from water, hydropower, 40% uh, is made by nuclear. <clears throat> and of course, anything about heat is done with fossil, unfortunately, most of that still. Uh, and uh, Switzerland has uh, filed a law uh, a couple of years ago, which has two stages. By 35, we will have shut down all nuclear power plant plants. Uh, this is part of the energy strategy part one and by 2050 we are completely renewable and uh, as it is in Switzerland if you if you file law the law is binding and so we will keep that goal the point is that we want to drive a bit faster so I will talk of a very specific part of that energy strategy this is about thermal energy storage Switzerland is a country where we have warm summers and cold winters so we have this seasonal issue and uh, typically uh, we have no, until now, we have not that cold demand in summer, but we have a heat demand in winter time. And uh, I'm talking about closing this gap in the winter time by thermal energy storage because in winter time, sun is not shining in Switzerland enough and we will, uh, we need to bring also heat into the winter to, to get the decarbonized heating system. Um, 
residential heat. So first of all, on the left hand side, you will see you see uh, the the energy demand in Switzerland. About fifty percent is for heating, uh, space heating, hot water, domestic hot water, or process heat, and uh, about one third is for mobility. So mobility soon will be electrified totally. Already now, we have fifty percent of the persons drive by uh, public railway. And uh, we will, we are on the forefront in changing fossil cars to electric vehicles. In the residential sector, <clears throat> let me put in a better pointer here. In the residential sector, uh, we have about 80% which is used for, for providing heat. And here is the point where we attack, where we want to replace this heating by oil and gas uh, with heat pumps and heat pumps with the support of a seasonal thermal energy storage. So this is a classic picture you may have seen. This is the total demand in kilowatt hours. So we have here gigawatt hours. Uh, eight gigawatt hours, which is a small amount, but large amount for us. And we have here the season. So during the summertime, we can produce uh, enough energy uh, in future. And during the winter time, we have a gap. So the goal is to bring heat from the summertime produced by PV and heat pumps uh, into the winter time. So that's a quite simple point. And uh, what it is about thermal energy storage is mainly an economic factor, not a technology factor, in my opinion. So what possibilities do we have in general? First, we have the so-called sensible heat. So we store the heat in water, in soil, in concrete, uh, uh, underground. And uh, we have a potential, potential capacity of 250 megajoule per cubic meter. And the heat we can store is proportional to the delta T to the temperature lifts. Let's say we lift the temperature from 15 or 20 degrees Celsius to 60 degrees Celsius. So this is, says the amount of heat we can store. Some of you may have heard about the so-called latent heat storages, which is done with phase change materials. So here we use the phase change and the latent heat. And this is proportional to a Pro property of this particular pro uh, materials. And there is one specific material, which is water ice, uh, which has a large uh, latent heat, but uh, at the wrong temperature of zero degrees Celsius. And there are many possible phase change materials. I will go into that detail a bit later. And there's also the thermochemical uh, possibility to store uh, heat, which is related to some reaction enthalpy. However, in terms of technical feasibility, these things, uh, those technologies are under development and uh, they have not proven long-term stability yet. And in my opinion, cost-wise, thermochemical storages will not play a role for seasonal storages in future. So here are some pictures of possible or solutions which we investigate, which are realized and where we look into optimization. Uh, first of all, uh, a quite specific possibility is that we put a tank into the building. So the general idea here is that this tank would store the, thermos, the thermal heat of the summer for the winter time. And the idea to put it into the building is based on the, on the hypothesis that any heat losses would go into the building because a thermal storage has losses, any storage has losses, and those storages are not, those losses are not lost in total, but they are at the right place. However, in summertime, heat losses in summertime are a disadvantage of such storages. I will, I will show some pictures on that. The other solution which we follow and which we have already realized is that we have vacuum insulated tanks, which we uh, which we put into the ground close to the building or below the building. And uh, we use this whole capacity uh, for, uh, for the house. So question here is design and construction, vacuum insulation, how to realize that without thermal bridges. And also uh, in Switzerland, we live on rocks. So uh, burying large holes is an issue. It's not, not very simple uh, in Switzerland. Um, there are other possibilities like ground heat exchangers, excuse me that this picture is so small. 
So we have uh, coils so which, which can be used to heat up the ground. However, if this is uh, low to surface, we have a lot of losses of thermal energy during the, during the winter time before we can use them. Another technology which, which is uh, already established in Switzerland or in, also in south of Germany is the so-called ice storage. So what you have here is a tank uh, with heat exchanger coils and you have a heat pump in the building. So during the winter time, during the summertime, you are charging this to a certain temperature, low temperature by thermal solar, for instance. And then during the winter time, you are discharging, means uh, the uh, heat pump uses its source from this water tank. At a certain moment, this tank is then discharged totally. And then the water is going to become close to zero degrees Celsius but we are discharging further. And this means we are discharging at zero degrees Celsius and freezing the ice. Freezing the ice uh, incorporates a lot of enthalpy at only zero degrees Celsius, but this is then far better zero degrees Celsius as this, the ambient temperature, which is in Switzerland part-wise uh, minus 10, minus 20 degrees Celsius. So this is successfully uh, sold already from the company Fisman. And uh, a technology which we are going to develop is, looks on the first side quite simple, but has its technical uh, problems. So a lot of buildings in future will have unused uh, parts and those unused parts like old park lots, because cars will re remove, uh, will disappear part wise and we would uh, change the design or we would change those caverns into thermal energy storages. So what we need then is a design of insulation plus vapor and water barrier, which would allow the insulation to stay stable for 50 years or so. And this, uh, this is an ongoing research project to realize an appropriate uh, solution for this, which I will explain more in detail. Uh, other so in south of Germany and in Netherlands, you find those solutions. You find large tanks, uh, which are used then for districts and which you bury under earth. Uh, So-called tank storages. Uh, we have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 cubic meters in size and you have playgrounds or park above or what we call then pit storages, even larger. Large constructions, large designs. Some of them have been realized. Uh, until now, they are not economically. What is very common already are so-called borehole storages. Uh, so you have vertical boreholes, uh, fields of 100, 200, 400 of such boreholes and they form a complete area below earth in the stone uh, which then uh, store the heat of the summer. And if the field is large enough, the losses compared to the capacity are reasonably small. Uh, there are some other specific borehole storages where you put in hot uh, water uh, and you can recover it from some other uh, holes, uh, holes. Or the other solution, what we call is aquifer. An aquifer uses flowing water underground. So you would, if the flow of the water is low enough, you can insert heat in the winter, in the summertime and it would distribute and you would, it flows to the right direction. If the whole system is uh, correctly designed, you have the heat at the right position uh, in, the, in the winter time. Uh, for instance, the German Bundestag is heated in this way. Yeah. Okay. So ah, coming back from this situation here with the boreholes, and uh, the complicated situation uh, which they cover because you need very, very long and deep uh, drills. We uh, started with a drilling company, a project which we call horizontal, horizontal thermal energy storage. So this is a, a typical drilling company. And like you may know from these fracking guys we have heard uh, before. So they are capable of drilling uh, or coordinated, so three-dimensional drilling and there they can insert the drill hole on some on one point and can exit at an exit pit on another point. So it is possible to combine 
the tubes here on this position. And what you can then design is a field underground, which is then three dimensional and which can be managed by flowing into some of the pipes and extracting on other pipes. Uh, the big advantage or the advantage why we follow this is the, is the possibility that such drill holes can be placed below buildings or below parking lots or below existing structure. And this means they are invisible, not seeable, and any losses of the heat to the top would then even heat or would, uh, would be recovered from the, from the buildings, from the, from the factories or from the gardening, uh, gardening structure. <clears throat> Here's a picture of such a managed thermal energy storage. So you have uh, at the center, for instance, during the heating time, you would charge from the center and you would dis discharge from the outside. And in the uh, winter time while discharging, you would start on the outside. And this will then reduce or minimize the heat losses of such a uh, near ground geothermal energy storage. And for instance, here, this is shown that this is below a parking lot. So such a parking lot is then ice free during the winter time. But of course, such a structure can also be made below buildings. So here's the test unit. So we started with this. Uh, this is a factory. Uh, no, that's not a factory. That is in, in fact the, the uh, the company side of this bore uh, of this drilling company and we drilled here you see the orange line and you see a green line we drilled two long holes at different design uh, different geometry and we try to measure or the intention is now to measure while charging or discharging to measure the temperature evolvement in the ground so there are many more holes which then give us temperature measurements everywhere here in this area below the factory so here's such a picture of this temperature involvement and we are not ready with this project. It just shows that we charged, we charged that storage and uh, from May to July last year. Uh, and uh, so we see here then with, a temp, with the time and also with the geometry, the involvement of the temperature of these two pipes. So we, they were operated in two different modi and we use then this uh, measure temperature uh, curves to optimize uh, three-dimensional fluid dynamics model, which we can then use to design in future complete structures. And, uh, yeah, and, and th these measurements are made to verify our models. Another solution, which is not possible in Switzerland because Switzerland has no free ground, is uh, the possibility of um, uh, so-called ponds. This is a solution from Denmark. Uh, I personally also live in Denmark. I have a house there. So Denmark has a lot of space and uh, many years ago they started with these ponds. You see here in the lower picture the pond during construction and on the upper upper half of the picture you see the whole design. This is before filling the pond with water and you see here the district and the factory and uh, the area where they use, you need a large area of thermal energy solar to charge the pond. And the pond is that big that there is no insulation. Huh? They, put, they put insulation on top, so swimming insulation, but in principle, the, the, the heat losses are quite small. Uh, relative to the to the amount of the cap to the capacity so that they have no no particular insulation so the ground itself is the insulation but that's uh, that's of course uh, this is a very low cost situation if you compare then the, the the amount of capacity you you produce here I show later a picture of the of the cost they have so this is the Swiss solar tank a little bit uh, neat, small solutions. So what you have is you have these uh, relatively large tanks for the buildings, which you put into the construction and you build the building around. Because you can't, it's, it's complicated to place them into the building afterwards. So, and then on the right hand side, you see here realized buildings, they have thermal solar on top. Huh? Everything is thermal solar and not, not PV and heat pumps. And then you have this situation a bit exaggerated, the tank, but, but the, the main problem is that the tank consumes a large portion of the volume of the building. And um, 
buildings in Switzerland are, are expensive. Uh, the volume, the, the ground is expensive. So uh, this, is a, this is a problem for doing this, but this company's, uh, company Yeni is the name, they produce around 100, 150 of, so, of such tanks per year and they sell it, uh, yeah, they sell it even, they even export those tanks. And uh, this is a reliable technology, and also for uh, revamp, you 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 find this for re for revamp. You have here uh, the large tank, which is used in uh, in the city center, in which is placed as a retrofit into an existing building. And uh, yeah, inside of these tanks, you find these heat exchanger coils for uh, for heating, floor heating, and also for domestic hot water production. Uh, another concept which we have not read, realized, which we are starting now, is what we call electrothermal energy storage. This is a concept, this is not a seasonal storage. Uh, it's a storage uh, for a grid stabilization. So any excess electricity of the grid uh, can be stored in terms of, uh, in form of heat, heat and cold. And uh, while there is a demand on, on electricity, this installation would then discharge again. So it is consisting of four components. One is, it's, let's start with the one component, which is a, a heat pump. So you have a large heat pump in the four, five, 20 megawatt region. And those such a heat pump in case of ele excess electricity would then produce, would then charge a hot storage. So we have here three hot storages and would discharge a cold storage, an ice storage. We produce it from uh, as an ice storage, latent heat storage. And uh, it is producing cold and heat and using, uh, so consuming electricity. And when there is capacity or when there is electricity demand, uh, uh, an organic ranking cycle would then use the cold as the heat sink and would use the hot storage as the heat source. And we would produce electricity from the, uh, uh, from the cold and the hot storage. This design itself will probably not be economically. So we think of inserting this uh, in combination with district heating, in combination with a factory need for cold and heat. So for instance, a dairy industry would be interested because they have a demand on cold and hot, store, uh, hot water, and they already have usually all the heat pumps. So it's, it would be an extension of their, of their facilities. Um, large storages is usually is about costs. What you find here is a, uh, on this chart, you find here on the Y axis the investment cost per cubic meter of water equivalent. For instance, um, roughly, I would say 50, uh, one cubic meter of water can roughly store 50 kilowatt hours of heat or cold. And then you see this, and then here on the x axis, you have the storage, the absolute to, uh, storage volume. It's a log logarithmic uh, curve here. So that's clear, huh? that's the number of size, or well, that's the scaling curve. The larger you go with your storages, the smaller are your investment costs. And for instance, the smallest we have here, 30 Swiss francs per cubic meter, is the storage in Denmark. And if you go to the very, very small storages below one cubic meter, you are at the domestic hot water storages. So in our opinion, storages become can become commercially uh, economically if we have costs investment costs in the region of 300 200 swiss francs a swiss franc is by the way is like a dollar huh? it's about one dollar per cubic meter and we we are targeting for storage sizes uh, below uh, 100 cubic meters or in this area 100 to 1000 cubic meters uh, phase change materials. For for those who know that, uh, you can you can sleep for a second. For those who don't know, so what is a phase change material doing? For uh, I start with sensible heat storage. So we have here the blue curve. We have here the enthalpy content of water with increasing temperature, and of course the slope of this curve is the specific. Uh, specific heat of water, of liquid water, 4.2 kilojoule per kilogram. So from 
zero degrees Celsius starting up to 100 degrees Celsius. And then here the entropy will increase because you have evaporation. When we use an organic material, material a suitable phase change material, which has a phase change around, uh, let's say 213 Kelvin, uh, 40 degrees Celsius or so, um, we would have a, uh, the slope is less, less steep because organic materials have a lower uh, specific uh, heat capacity. And then we have a, steep increase because we are going we are going into the phase change from solid to liquid and then when all the material is molten melted we would have then the slope of liquid organic materials usually a little bit lower than the solid ones when we go back so we go into freezing we have an effect what we call supercooling i don't go into this detail now and then we recover all the heat which we have which we call then latent heat or heat of melting or uh, heat of freezing it's it's all this is the same amount of entropy so and and let's say we have a certain temperature lift uh, delta t delta theta we would apply this to the phase change material we can have this amount of entropy to store in contradiction to water for the same temperature lift we have a smaller amount of uh, enthalpy so phase change material in general would allow to store more heat in the same uh, in in the same volume but attention it's a question of this delta t if this delta t window is large enough the the water the sensible heat of water can be equal or even be above the phase change the, lat the latent heat of a suitable phase change material so phase change material is a very interesting techno technological option but for thermal energy storages for seasonal storages eventually not um, so what are phase change materials so we have here uh, let's say a temperature region in, in Kelvin that's from the VDE heat atlas picture from the VDE heat atlas and here we have the phase change capacity in kilowatt hours per cubic meter so that what counts at the end so you have a certain volume and how many how much energy can you store in that certain volume and we start with this one certain point here this blue dot which is water huh? water is at 273 Kelvin zero degrees Celsius it has an entropy of 333 kilojoule per kilogram, which makes around 90 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. So it is at the wrong temperature. What we are interested in is room temperature. This is why we have here so many investigated phase change materials. And the uh, classical one are paraffins. Uh, pa paraffins usually have low enthalpy and there are interesting aqueous, uh, there are salt hydrates and sugar alcohols which have which show high enthalpies, but are not uh, industrially not used so far. And just to see what happens if you have a typical case of water, which has a, a delta T of uh, from 60 to 15 means 45 Kelvin, uh, we would need a phase change material, which has above 60 kilowatt hours per cubic meter or let's say uh, 180 kilojoule per kilogram so it's uh, we we need to carefully think of phase change materials in seasonal storage in my opinion it will never play a role because water is cheap water is for free soil is for free and uh, everything now limits to the design of a suitable uh, a suitable insulation solution so here again the picture of that building this is this building which has a thermal solar and very simplified thermal solar energy goes into a water tank and what we need is now a water tank where the insulation will never ever see in its lifetime humidity because humidity that is diffusing from the water tank into the insulation will destroy the insulation property and will then lead to heat losses and if you think of closed buildings or closed structures which are existing you have never ever the possibility to go into this and to try it from outside so this is a simple situation and uh, uh, it seems to be banal what what you have to do is you have to provide first an insulation which is solid enough to 
carry the load of the water tank. Let's say the tank is a few meters high, and where the uh, the, the the diffusion barrier is good enough for years, for many years. So uh, we were building up such a uh, such a test unit, a few hundred, uh, a few decades of um, cubic meters with water, where we have a charging charging unit with solar panels, heat exchanger, uh, plus an electric heater to to speed it up a bit, and we have a heat pump and air heater which we place then close uh, within a factory to demonstrate the, the feasibility of such a situation. So what we developed is first, what we had to develop is a multi-layer polymer bitumen based membrane. This membrane uh, is not a membrane, it shall be tight, shall be tight against water, uh, liquid water, of course, uh, but also against diffusion of water. And so what we have in principle, we have a metallic layer inside which is then the uh, uh, sheet number three, which is consisting of even three different layers, which shall then uh, make the whole situation tight. And the problem was not to produce such a layer. The problem was to make it in cost, in a cost effective way. And the company, which is our research partner here is now starting to produce this, this bitumen layer. Uh, the other question was the long-term creep behavior of the insulation. So we have uh, our targets or our, our candidates was uh, polyisocyanate and uh, polystyrene <coughs> insulation materials. And uh, here is a picture of the pressure situation. So this is the tank and uh, the tank has a height of uh, six meters. So what we have is we have a pressure load. Huh? So let's say here is ambient pressure and at the bottom, we have an additional 60 kilopascal or 600 millibars for six meter water water pipe. And typically the storage is hot in the top and cold in the bottom. So we have a thermal load in the top and uh, usually less thermal load on the bottom of the tank. So this is the situation. So the material has to withstand a pressure, this pressure and has to withstand also long-term stability against this temperature. And uh, we had, the company had two materials which we were thinking uh, they would be capable of being used. And we had to investigate uh, how could that, how can they withstand this for a time of 50 years and uh, including also some commercial questions. So first thing we had to do is to develop a method or, or to find a method of measuring the creeping behavior. So what we did is we have samples of the different materials. So you see a little bit the difference in the color. And um, so we put a weight, a heavy weights on that, on that uh, samples and we measure then the creeping uh, uh, with, a, with digital instruments. And from this creeping with time, we can then we can then extrapolate to the creeping behavior for a long term period of uh, 50 years. So uh, we were not the first who was who were investigating such things. There was a, a person Findlay. There is the so called Findlay approach, uh, long long time ago, and uh, the, the Europeans we like like norms. Uh, we have the European norm 1606, which is taking this Findlay approach. And what you need is to measure one point and one and two third of a year totally to extrapolate to be able to extrapolate to 50 years. So this Findlay has done this uh, for these long periods and uh, verified the method. It's a principally a very simple exponent um, potential approach where you have the time dependent deformation uh, starting with an initial deformation with a su sudden deformation when you start the measurement and then you measure deformation by time and you can fit this one par these two parameters A and B. And so uh, there are uh, there is one method which which we call stepped isothermal method method. So with you measure a certain time. So you put the probe under temperature in this cavern, and then you step up with the temperature. You do again, step up again with the pressure, and there is a couple of calculations you have to do. And afterwards, you get such a curve which gives you then an extrapolation possibility to hours of 10 by seven, huh? so into the 50 years region. Um, so 
what we have now, what we have now is we have, of course, uh, this research project is not going on for 50 years. So we have done this um, for close to two years and the blue curve are the measurements for this material XPS and uh, at, at 40 degrees Celsius and the red curve are the measurements for XPS done at um, 60 degrees Celsius. Of course, 60 degrees Celsius shows more creeping and um, to go to the 50 years, uh, 40 degree, we can extrapolate that we have a creeping of 0.5% of the volume. And for 60 degrees, uh, we can extrapolate to be 1%, which is less than the design target of 6%. And so we knew, okay, that is working and we're starting to build that. Uh, we have a uh, we have a building, an existing cavern, which we then designed with a lot of measurement instruments. You see here some of my, of my colleagues, Sebastian here. We put in humidity sensors every, everywhere in this building. We placed a door, a very nice door to look into our storage. And uh, yeah, also we had to experiment on a proper proper installation of the materials modular installation. Uh, also very critical is the welding, welding needs of this uh, vapor, vapor barrier. And yeah, after, after the whole design, this installation has been flooded and we are now, we have charged that and we are now measuring, uh, measuring the thermal behavior of that storage. So to conclude, um, for us in Switzerland, uh, we think that is one necessary puzzle piece in our energy strategy. We need to have the electric demand. We need to mitigate the electric demand in winter by having seasonal storages of heat. And we think this is the ideal combination with uh, photovoltaic and heat pumps. And uh, we, show, uh, we have shown in different examples and different technical solutions that the seasonal storage of heat is feasible and economic. And uh, we, we think that soil activation under existing buildings is very, is very interesting, particularly in, in, in a country like Switzerland where, where ground is very expensive. And this is the picture of uh, Lucerne uh, by night, which you see here is the mountain, Mount Pilatus. Uh, I think, uh, Many Chinese and many Indian people have been there on the non Pilatus, <laughs> and you and you are welcome to to join them. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is the finish of my presentation, and I'm ready for questions. Great. Yeah, thanks, Roger, for the great talk and introducing this very attractive technology to us. Um, there are many questions, but we have limited time, so uh, let me condense it. Uh, there is a very interest, interesting question from uh, the audience asking that uh, uh, about the earthquake resistance of this technology. Following this question, right, so uh, what is your vision about uh, the uh, limit of this technology in terms of uh, uh, the local geographic conditions, uh, the local climate or weather conditions, uh, yeah. and also the commercial environment and the government policy. Uh, yeah, so, so what you, can you share your vision about, uh, about yeah. this? We haven't, we haven't investigated uh, in particular about uh, uh, the earthquake resistance. Uh, I heard this from time to time. We are also doing experiments with geothermal, so 2,000, 3,000 meters deep. And uh, we had earthquakes in Switzerland and the uh, paradox is that people say we have to stop this research because uh, because of the earthquake risk, which is significant in Switzerland, but we drive five nuclear power plants on our earthquakes situation, which is a super critical situation. And uh, this is a paradox in my opinion. So I think if we leave this at sizes of a few hundred cubic meters, uh, nobody or only few people would die in case of an earthquake from those thermal storages. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, what about uh, 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 other things like uh, uh, the weather, for example, uh, if you use water, right? So is there any requirement for uh, local seasonal uh, temperature change and you will change your technology or uh, the medium you use to store the thermal energy. Yeah, yeah. so 
yeah, may, may I, might be at the moment Switzerland is in a super comfortable situation. We have an excess of water, of even drinking water. Uh, 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 climate change calculations calculate that water would be reduced. But I mean, once the water is in the tank, it is in the tank and it's not a water consumption. So I think uh, compared to the water consumption in Switzerland or what is raining, it's, it's negligible, definitely. Yeah. And soil, soil would not be covered from that, such a fact. I mean, soil is there. Sure, sure, yeah. What about uh, the, the, the commercial environment and the government policy? Uh, Switzerland, uh, uh, I think most of our great examples uh, uh, in applications are in uh, Switzerland. Uh, what do you think if you uh, try to apply this technology uh, or market it in uh, the countries like uh, China and the US? Uh, yeah. yeah. So my, my personal opinion is, for instance, there would be a uh, uh, in, in South China, if, if you would go to Dai, Dai Lan province, eh? uh, Dai Lan province, you would probably have a storage for heat there as well. And if you would go to uh, Guangzhou area, you would eventually design this as a cold storage because you can produce cold in the, the winter. I mean, the winter time in Guangzhou is not so cold, but you could store cold for the winter time, and your climate climatization systems would be more uh, would be more efficient. For Texas, uh, I have friends who live in you close to Houston. Uh, I, I started with him a personal a personal project, a private project. I mean, you have these day night shifts, uh, which are extreme in, in, in Texas or even in, San, in, in California. So I would see uh, day night storages for cold and heat. So storing cold from the night for the next day uh, for the climatization and in texas you have some days which are 100 fahrenheit during the day and the next days you have 50 fahrenheit so i've seen these dramatic temperature changes there so i would see some some niche projects somewhere but uh, i think seasonal storage needs uh, the ideal situation if you have four uh, maximum three four months of cold time and uh, let's say six, seven months of uh, warm time. So this Switzerland is of course a perfect location for this. Yeah. Great, yeah, thank you. Uh, due to limited time, uh, we have to move on to the next speaker, uh, but Dr. Ludger uh, uh, Fischer will be here in the coffee break after this session. So if you have more technical questions, you can, uh, you can ask him. Uh, yeah. So now, uh, thank you. Thank